four verses one through five. I'd like to read that to you again. Second Timothy four verses one through five. How many know that God loves you? You know, it's so hard to see sometimes in the midst of the storm when the the storms are thick. And bring our group that we meet with. Uh, one of the families lives in Colorado uh, that we meet with on Zoom once a week to do ministry with. And they sent a picture of, after the fact, a double rainbow. And I love seeing the rainbows up here in the mountains. Man, it's, it's just incredible. And then a little while later, they sent the picture before the rainbow appeared. And it was, it was very gloomy. There was even a, a funnel cloud that had, was forming and coming down in there that they were able to capture. It was up there in Colorado. And you know, it's hard to see sometimes that in the midst of the doom and the gloom, that there is a rainbow that's going to manifest. And that rainbow is a reminder of God's everlasting covenant, his everlasting love, and that he's going to see us through. On the back of Toby and Glenda's car, he says, I got this. And then it says, God. And I love that. Every time I walk past that, I read it and I reflect on it. That even though I may be going through a trial, going through something that's heavy and it's hard to see, I've got to remind myself. And we need to remind each other that he hasn't. How many of you have gotten over the other side and passed that thing, whatever it is? And some of you are thinking about things right now that you're even going through. But you get to the other side of it, and you stop and you look back, and it's like, well, you got that after all, didn't you? Come on. If not, you're still there, right? <laughs> but I would say that there has been trials and temptations and things that's come across every one of our plates, and there are many of us, there, it's, it's everybody of us in here, we can stop and we can look back and say, wow, he brought me through that. Has there been anything that God's ever brought you through? No. Good point, Toby. I know. Wait a minute, I can find it. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. We don't even realize. God is faithful, folks. Trust Him. Somebody was saying something. Was it you, Glenda? You're still here. That's right. Praise the Lord. So, amen. Look at your neighbor and say, he's got it and he's going to get you through it. Amen. Let's read the scripture. It says, I charge thee, this is Paul talking to Timothy, but it's the holy words of God given for us. It says, I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. It says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all the long suffering and doctrine. That is an instruction for us, is it not? That is instruction. And I think we need to stop and preach the word to ourselves. Because that is the dealing with the plank in the eye and getting it out so that we can preach the word to those that have specs. Sandy and I were talking about, so I wonder if specs, after a while, if they don't get dealt with, they turn into planks. I think they do. They have an attraction to continue to draw things in. They continue to. So a plank, your message that a few Sundays back, man, I think it's like, how long has that been there? And sometimes planks can grow overnight and just be huge. Can they not? But when something's not dealt with, what happens is it continues to grow and grow and grow. And that is the picture that God tells us in his word. He says, don't compound sin with sin. Don't compound with sin with more sin. He says, just deal with it. Just do what I'm telling you to do. Acknowledge your sin. Take responsibility. Repent. Get the mind renewed and move on. Quit being pulled back into the past. Quit being pulled down by the things that are so weighty. He says, deal with the sin and move on. Amen? And when we do, we can stand and look back and say, why don't you pull me through that one? Amen? Can you not? Man does not like to be reproved or rebuked. How many of you like it? That's why I said a few Sundays ago, how many of you like it when the Lord rebukes you? Man, I don't like it. 
It ain't no fun. I, I think about the scripture that says, train a child the way you should go, and he's old and will not depart from it. I don't get joy out of spanking my kids. My dad used to tell me, it's going to hurt you more than it hurts me. I'm like, yeah, right. My, it's my butt that's getting ready to get that belt or that switch. And I didn't get that as a kid. But it did with him. But yet he did it anyway. Amen. And mama did it. Because they knew that for the, for the time being, it's not a fun thing. But if we would stay consistent, it's going to bring blessings. Amen. So I would propose to us that for us as individuals, when God is dealing with our heart, yield your heart to him. And let him do what he needs to do. Amen. Because if you would, and if you do, then you'll get past that thing. I see Israel as wandering in the wilderness for 40 years because they had some extreme anxiety. When, when the report came back about the land, what did God tell them? You're going to go over to the land, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do that. And, and, and Moses sent out the spies, and all the spies except for two of them came back, Joshua and Caleb. And those other spies are like, ooh, it's bad. It's bad. We saw some giants over there in the land. We were as grasshoppers in our own sight compared to them. Well, they had removed God out of the equation and only allowed for themselves to be standing there next to that giant. And, of course, that's going to bring in what's called a grasshopper spirit. A grasshopper spirit is fear. You ever seen a grasshopper stand its ground with you? You ever gone, you know, eye to eye with a grasshopper? Oh, I'm going to get you. What does he do? Because he's standing there and says, yeah, you come on. <laughs> no, that grasshopper, you start getting a little closer, boom, it's gone. It's hopped off over here and hopped off over there. That's fear, not stepping up to the plate, but jumping and getting out of the way. When God says, I got this. I got this. I got you. Stand your ground. Amen. In verse 3, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. I think we need to just constantly remind ourselves that sound doctrine is what we should be standing on. If you don't stand on sound doctrine, then the next thing you know, you're not going to be standing at all. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, and I would propose that there's some things going on inside of us already that desire things that are not of God, and that's what opens up the door. How about rebellion? You got a heart of rebellion and it hasn't been dealt with? How about some pride? They go hand in hand. You can be guaranteed that the enemy is going to bring some stuff and continue to feed more and more of that to you. The Word of God says, you know, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a what? A fall. You can be guaranteed that, that the Word says it. So is that what's going to happen? Sure it is. We need to deal with it. Amen. Yes. It, says, it says in here, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Same thing? Yep. They won't allow it. Yeah. Yeah, they won't allow it. We don't want to have anything to do with that. <laughs> they won't allow it. They won't endure it. They won't suffer it. And yeah, we think about that word suffer. What is that word suffer? You know? You know, it, it's like the word be careful for nothing. When I was a kid, I used to read that and think be careful. I means I just push off all things that would try to hold me back and just don't worry about it. You know, and in so many words, it was what we was saying. Don't worry, move forward when you're standing on the word of God. But I was looking at it in the wrong perspective. The word says, don't be a fool and die before your time. <laughs> but when I learned that careful means anxious, it brought in the right perspective. And I realized, oh, okay. How many deal with anxiousness? <clears throat> Anybody anxious about Pastor getting done with this sermon so we can go eat? Come on, Pastor. Yeah. 
Well, that could be a form of anxiousness. Good, yeah. Anxiousness is anxiety. And it puts forth the thought process that something's not going to work out unless you do something. And there's many things that we could talk about this morning. And I want to remind you that God's got it. He's got you. He's got you. He's got it. What did we sing last Sunday? The, the kids sang it. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world. Y'all the kids were singing it. Come on, you gotta help me out. Y'all did a good job. And then it says he's got the little bitty baby, swear. And I looked over at Cisco and he's doing the motion. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, come on. Anxiety tells you that, no, we don't. He don't have it. You better start picking it up and worrying about it. You better stress over it because that's what you're good about doing. How many are, are good stressors in here? That's probably an oxymoron. <laughs> what I mean is, how many of you plug into that very quickly? When something's not going quite the way that you picture it in your mind, how many of you listen to the enemy and start, oh my goodness. You know, how many of us are good hand wringers? You're wringing your hands together. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, yeah, because you've not gotten into the Word of God and you're not trusting God. So, no, you don't know what to do. But I'm going to tell you right now, the Word of God tells you what to do. Cast all your anxiety upon who? Congress? Good luck. <laughs> your mayor? <laughs> no, upon him. Upon God. Cast it. So that's something that you must do. Hey, would you do it for me? Oh, come on. Just, 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 just take it out of me. Take that anxiety. Just reach in there, grab it, and, and, and cast it upon God for me, would you? She ain't gonna do it. Would you do it for me? You have a lot. Okay, yeah. Roy, please, can you help me out? Can you help me out with this, man? Please? No. Do it yourself. Thank you. Do it your own self. <laughs> Now, it's one thing to say, hey, that's anxiety. You're, 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 you're letting that thing just rule and reign you. And it's one thing to instruct, to give instructions in righteousness and say, hey, you need to just give that to God. I can't give it to him for you. You're going to need to do that. And yes, we may need some instructions on how to do that. And I would propose that if you have some anxiety, there's a trust breakdown somewhere with us. Amen? There's a trust breakdown and the old wall here. <laughs> Let's look at the wall. The trust breakdown is the significant acceptance and the security. That we feel insignificant somewhere. We're feeling like, hey, I'm not being accepted somewhere. And I'm not feeling secure somewhere. So those three areas produce what's called trust issues. Because in the Word of God, He says that we have all three of those things. Amen? Has God accepted you? Yes. Does God say that you're secure in Him? Yes. Are you significant in His eye? Yes. What kind of fruit are you in His eye? Yeah. Good fruit. What is it? Good, Good fruit. He says you're the apple of his eye. Glory to God. I'm the apple of my father's eye. He loves me. Look at your neighbor and say you're the apple of our father's eye. And I am too. Hallelujah. That's some sound doctrine, is it not? Is that sound doctrine? Is that? Yes, it is. That is sound, because it is what? Truth. It's truth. I want to put forth a challenge to you this week. 
I challenge you. Listen, challenge is good, is it not? <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> challenge is good because what happens when there's no challenge, there's no opportunity for you to mature. Think about that. So challenge will bring about and will produce maturity. If I never challenge my children to do things, to live right, to step up to the plate, but I'm always doing it for them, what would that do? It would hinder their maturity, would it not? What do the eagles do with the little ones when they start getting their feathers and they're getting, oh, it's fun here in the nest. We've got a uh, chipmunk up on the mountain. We've got lots of chipmunks. How many got chipmunks at your house? I probably do, whether you know it or not. You remember the, the tablecloth that we left on the picnic table? I went out the other day, and I'm looking around this thing. I'm like, well, that's weird how the wind is blowing. And it was just, I'm like, I don't feel the wind blowing over here. It's like, it's moving. And I'm like, what in the world? And I was drawn to that tablecloth. It is a nice tablecloth. It ain't nice anymore. <laughs> it's cheap. We're going to get another one, praise the Lord. But hallelujah. But I look and I was like, something's going on with that thing. And it has this little material on the back. It's nice and slick on the top so you can clean it off real easy. It's got a nice little print pattern on it. But I realize there's something underneath there tearing it apart and taking it off somewhere else because it's realized that, hey, that makes some good material to put in the nest for my little babies. It was a chipmunk. I'm not going to tell you what I did from there. <laughs> Eagles look for material to put into the nest in order to make it comfortable for the little eagles. But there comes a time, if you know anything about eagles, that they start taking out that material and discarding it. Like, oh, man, what was that? I thought it was comfortable over there. I guess why. I think I'm going to sit over here and after a little while, oh, man, that's not good either. There comes a time that the eagle will even put the little eagle up on the edge and push him out, won't they? Get out of the nest. Ah! You know, and usually those, those eagles are way up high. But it's so beautiful that the eagle will watch, and the eagle is very fast, and it will literally push them out and try to, you know, get them encouraged to fly, and they'll even swoop down and catch them. Y'all ever seen that? Good study of watching eagles. And they'll bring them back up. After a little bit, they'll try again. It's like, oh, what are you pushing me out of here for again? Oh, my goodness. I'm trying to flap. I'm trying to, oh, I can't stay up. I'm falling. Whew. Here's Mama. Pulled me back up again. And after a while, you learn to fly. I would say learn to stand. There's something about standing. Paul says, when you've done all to stand, he says, okay, go ahead, take your break, and go get your latte, and chill out in the shade over there. Is that what he says? Is that what he says, Mitch? Go get your latte. Do they have lattes back in the day? I don't think so. But they probably had some refreshing beverage of some sort, whether it be cold water or something. I don't know. No, he says, when you've done all to stand, stand. Continue to stand. It means fight. That's very good. Self-pity won't allow you to fight. Pride will cause you to fight and stand for things that are not right, that are in you. Haughtiness will cause you to fight towards the wrong goals, the wrong people. But I'm going to tell you, when you stand and you fight with the Word of God, you're standing on a foundation. You're standing on a foundation that will continue to endure, and that's what we need to be doing. So look at your neighbor and say, you need to stand and fight. When we don't stand and fight, I think what we're do is doing is we're abdicating our responsibility. How many of you are leaders in here? 
Two, three, four. I'm glad you raised your hand. Certainly you raising your hands. Every one of you are leaders. A leader, I'm gonna tell you right now, the job of being a leader does not come without sabotage. You can be very well expecting sabotage throughout your lifetime. Roy Vaughn, as you grow up, you're going to get more and more and more leadership responsibilities. But you can be guaranteed that the enemy ain't going to like that. And he's going to send things across your path to make you choose to do one thing or another. Remember that. The enemy constantly wants to sabotage each and every one of you as leaders so that you'll do one thing. Abdicate. What does abdicate mean? Leave your position. Surrender. You put out a, a white flag and say, okay, I'm done. <laughs> I think I'll just pack my bags and go on. You need to realize that. God has given to each and every one of us the right to stand and to fight. That means to stand your ground. When Paul was given that instruction, he was giving us a picture of a Roman soldier. Now, Roman soldiers, one day, and I'm believing one day, glory to God, I'm going to have a Roman soldier replica, probably not an original. That'd be really hard to find. I think they've had found some, though. <clears throat> That'd be very expensive. I'll settle with a replica. But to set up, you know, when he talks about the armor of God, he's not talking about a knight, uh, you know, shining armor and all that. That's not the example that Paul was giving us. And I've seen a lot of illustrations with, you know, talking about the, the, the show of faith and stuff, but they give a knight in shining armor, and it's like, eh, not it. Paul was looking at a Roman soldier. Roman soldiers, if you've ever been to Jerusalem, I've never been there, I'm going to be there one day, praise the Lord. But the streets of Jerusalem, you can look at the cobblestones, the, 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 the things that they walk on in the street, the stones that are there, and you will be amazed when you look at it with the scoring in the deep grooves that are in there and those grooves came from the Roman soldiers marching the streets the best way I can give you an example would be today maybe a football player or somebody that has some cleats but it was more extreme than that they would put into their sandals things that would allow them to take a grip that when they were engaged in battle engaged in battle that their feet would take hold and not slip back. And your feet shine in the preparation of the gospel of peace. When you stand and you clean hands, this is the gospel of peace. There you go. Your feet are shod with the gospel of peace. That's part of the armor. That is something that we need to be Active and proactive in the Word of God. Because if you, the enemy, listen, I've been there for far too long in my life in the past, and when the enemy comes along, it's like, oh, okay, I'm you know, just, I'm sorry, you're going to have that ground. <laughs> and I back up. And after a little while, he doesn't want me even having the ground that I have right there. And I'm like, oh, okay, you can have that ground too. And before you know it, Run back here. Here I am. I'm in a corner. And what does he say? You stay put. You stay right there in the corner where you belong. Like an old dog. Stay. That is not my place. My place is to be out front as God's child and standing my ground and not giving in. We've all given in, though. But I'm going to tell you this morning, the areas you've given in to, you need to step up and say, Lord, forgive me for giving in that area because that's sin. Forgive me for allowing the enemy to entice me. I'm stepping up, Lord, because you say I can. You say, I got the power of the Holy Ghost on the inside of me. You say, I have your word, and I got it written right here, praise God. How many of you have more than one Bible at home? 
We have the word in abundance. Stand your ground. Don't give in. What did Winston Churchill tell Britain? Well, they were being bombed constantly by the Germans. Night and day. He said, never give up. Don't give up. Because in desperation and not trusting God, we give up, don't we? And when we give up, we get depressed. Because the enemy has come and taken and stolen something from us. And the next thing you know, you get oppressed because the devil has stolen something from you and you keep giving in. And I would encourage you and I would tell you this morning, don't give up. My challenge to you is this. When you wake up tomorrow morning, take five minutes to start telling God what you're thankful. Sandy and I were challenged with that over that Zoom meeting, and some people muted. Well, we all muted our mics, and we were together. So she would say one, and I'd say, well, "I'm thankful for this. I'm thankful for that." And before I knew it, it's like they were clicking back. Oh, all right, that's enough. And I'm like, "No, I want to keep going. <laughs> I got so much more than it, it, you know." It's a realization. It's like, whoa, like we did earlier. It's really not as bad as it seems. The enemy wants to paint you a picture and say it is, oh my goodness, bad. How many of you live in a cardboard box? How many of you live under a bridge? How many of you live in a tent? I got some men coming up here in a couple of weeks to Miracle Mountain to do the men's retreat. They're going to live in some tents for a few days. They're going to be thankful when they get back home to their air conditioning in their beds, I guarantee you. But hey, that's going to be a fun thing. Amen? It's not as bad as it seems. That's what fear does. Fear paints a picture and says it's bad and it's going to get worse, does it not? Because fear and faith, they are in the same dimensional in the spirit dimension is what's going on. And fear is trying its best to project itself into your future. And it demands to be fulfilled what it's projecting. So if it can get you in alignment with it, then there's a more likely chance that, yeah, that may happen or it may not happen. Which brings in more anxiety, more stress. But faith is a guarantee and demands to be fulfilled also into your future that if you will step into faith and trust God, that that's what's going to be fulfilled. Has he given you a promise? How many of you have had promises? Come on, we've had that. God gives us promises every day in his word. And he gives us sometimes, I believe a lot of times, he gives us promises, but they're in line with his word. It's like, oh, okay, yeah. Now unto him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to what? The power that works within you. How many got the Holy Ghost this morning? Amen. Then you have the power of God on the inside of you. And that power of God is equipping you if you will allow him to stand in faith. You can't stand in faith when the enemy comes and tells you things and you say, what would you say, devil? I didn't wear my shirt this morning. Shut up, devil. The word says, get thee behind me, Satan. That's his place. I would contend that he, he belongs underneath my foot. The old devil likes to squirm his way out, and he does some, from time to time. Because what happens is, I let my foot up. Think about that. Because I'm not standing. When you stand, you don't get in. But when you stop standing and you start to retreat, that's when he gets out. Quit letting him steal your ground. Amen? 
Man has a tendency when not desiring to face his sins. He has a tendency to turn away from sound doctrine. That's what we're talking about here. And in so doing, he looks for what he has conjured up in his own heart or his own gospel, or may I say, what a demon has given him or her to conjure up. Man, a demon can paint you a picture. Man, I've had dreams before and I wake up and I realize I'm not breathing. There's some fear, stress, and anxiety with that. And it's like, oh my goodness. I mean, wait a minute. The devil gave me that because God's not giving me the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. That doesn't line up with the word of God. Devil, get out of my bedroom in Jesus' name. How many of you have done spiritual warfare in your dreams? Where you're in your dreams, you're dreaming, and you're waking up out of it, and you realize you're standing there with your finger pointed at the devil, and like, in Jesus' name, and you wake up. You're like, what, what was that about? In Jesus' name, get out of here, devil. <laughs> right? Come on. 2 Timothy 4.4 4 says, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. There's nothing left that when you turn your ear from the truth other than fables, half-truths, complete mistruths. The fables here is the word mythos, and it is used for the idea of tuition, which means that they will be willing to pay someone to instruct them. Here, let me pay you to tell me what to do. How many of you have been in a place and you're like, just tell me what to do? I don't know what to do. I don't know how to. You're double-minded. You're double-minded. You're listening to the enemy. You want to listen to God, but you're not dealing with the enemy. You're double-minded. The Webster's meaning of this word is the price of payment for instruction. You need to get the picture here that what is happening in the end times is that people wanting to have knowledge, they go to the point of paying like a private tutor a fee to instruct them so that they can learn. But the disconnect is that there are many instructors readily available to instruct with some truth, but they're going to sprinkle it with a fable. It's not the whole truth. Whole truth. Nothing but the truth. It is the truth that you shall know and it shall make you free. Amen? So if you're not knowing the truth, but you're knowing a partial truth, and it's laced with some untruth, are you going to be made free? No. You can't. I would say that's probably a, in a form of some maybe strange fire. You can't conjure up something in your own mind and bring it into what God calls the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or what a demon's conjured up. It's like new age. You bring new age into your worship, you can be guaranteed that Jesus is not going to be there, folks. He's already hit the door and he's gone. But you bring new age and you can be guaranteed that there will be a spirit guide that is sure to come along and manifest to you a Jesus, but not Jesus. We need to be careful with new age practices. I did a <clears throat> series on new age, teaching on new age in the church a while back. And during the process of teaching on New Age, man, I lost a lot of the church. They left. <laughs> because I was exposing untruth in the church, and some folks didn't like it. That's okay. I want the truth. How many of you want the truth? If I'm doing something that is not in line with God's word, and I'm not worshiping him in spirit and in truth, then I would sure hope somebody would come along a brother or a sister in Christ and say, you know what, that's not biblical. You've been bewitched. <clears throat> One of the practices, this is just coming to my mind, that the church got into years and it's been a while. And every now and then I see it pop its little head up. No, come here. <clears throat> and this is it. Now I don't know it doesn't need prayer. But somebody else needs prayer that no one knows, and he's going to stand in vicariously for them, and we're going to pray over him. When have you ever seen that in the Word of God? You can go sit down. You've never seen that. Now, you've seen in the Word of God them praying over napkins and taking it. 
praying in that respect, but nobody's standing in. Witches do that. That's straight out of the, the, the book of the devil, man. I, we've had people in the past, heaven, 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 honey. They're like, well, they need prayer, so just pray over me, and I believe that they're vicariously going to receive that. Uh, no, they can't because there's no repentance in their heart. Witches do that. If you've had that practice in the past, you need to repent of it. I'll tell you right now. And ask the Lord to forgive you for doing that. Because it's a form of witchcraft. Now, don't get all freaked out on me. Look at your neighbor and say, don't get freaked out. <clears throat> Do you love the word? Yes. Man, I love the word. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Jesus. So, fables are myths. They will sprinkle truth with fables. What, <clears throat> what has been said in the past is that error rides in on the back of truth. Why? Why, why, does, why does error got to write in on the back of truth? Because if I were just to present you with error, and, it, and hopefully you mean the word of God, but I came in and just presented you with some error that was just wrong, wrong, wrong. Hey, there's a spaceship that's going to be coming by here pretty soon, Angel. It's going to be coming with a comet. And I'm telling you right now, we all need to meet the night before that. Drink some Kool-Aid. What would you do, Angel? You said, you get behind me, Satan. I'd be gone, man. Yeah. People have done that. But it's got to come in with a little bit of truth in order for you to say, huh, yeah, I think I'll take that. And I'm going to tell you right now that if you take a little bit, the enemy's got more coming. And the ultimate path is destruction, folks. It is destruction to kill, steal, and destroy, to take away from you the truth. The enemy's ways are constantly moving here to there so that you cannot ponder the way of life. It's over here. It's over there. Ooh, down there. Down there. Ooh, I just can't really nail it down. It's kind of like jello. Can you nail God's word down? You bet you can. He's nailed it down for us right here. I trust his word. Amen. The best place to be instructed is within the presence of God. Best place to be instructed without by the word is within the body of Christ. Because <clears throat> I sure would hope. If I got up here once, I'm not going to, but if I got up here and said, hey, you know, there's this uh, cosmic thing that's happening. Hell Bob's coming again. <laughs> I don't know if it's, it's coming back around. I don't know when it comes back around again. So we all know the story I'm talking about, though. And I think we all need to meet that night before it flies over because out there, Jesus is on that little thing out there. And we're going to connect. I would sure hope that some of you would say, uh, hold on, Pastor. What in the world do you think you're doing? And I tell you right now, folks, that when somebody says something that's not in line with the Word of God, you have the right to say that's not in the Word. Or at very least say, show me where that's in the Word. Come on. I would hope that you would have a faith in God and a stamina to be able to stand the ground and say, no. Nah. I don't think so. I don't think so. Look at your neighbor and say, stand. Stand on the word. Come on. Hallelujah. Listen, the end times are, you know, every generation is thought, well, the end is here, you know. Samuel's, my phone got dead. We were driving another vehicle back from Texas yesterday. Somebody had given us, blessed us with, with four by four, praise God, to get up and down off the mountain, to get people up and off there. And it's able to do exceeding above and above all we ask or think. Because they just gave it to us. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. But she had my phone because I didn't have a charger deal. Matter of fact, I realized this morning 
It doesn't even have the thing to plug it in. I'm, I'm going to have to get that. And that's okay. It's no big deal. There might be one in the back. But I gave her my phone, and she was looking up some stuff to listen to. And I guess on my YouTube feed, there was a, a deal on there that popped up about end times and things like that. It's a guy that watches out for things that are coming about. And that thing that you, you, you put on and you watch to listen to, they were talking about taking skin cells from two individuals, creating the sperm and creating an egg. And they got the technology to do this, folks, and creating a human being out of that. With the purpose of taking two homosexuals and taking it from both of them because they cannot produce what God has ordained from the very beginning in the garden, one man, one woman, and producing a child. And, I, and she told me about that, that they're, they're close, if not already. We've talked about some stuff, haven't we? But she's like, I have already done that. You know, when, when the government, <laughs> the government, don't mention the government. Stand yeah. When, when the government finally releases to the public something it has, it's usually 20 years after the fact. Did you know that? Your daddy has a picture. Praise God. Well, that wasn't in Vietnam. Well, we got proof it was. And they finally came out about 20 years later and said, yeah, we have that now. But it was there then. Pastor, yes, ma'am. When they create that little being, is that an yes. abomination? Oh, I, I believe it is an abomination. And, and I would, I don't know. Uh, my thoughts go to that is not sanctioned by God, number one. <clears throat> I don't know, but I wonder if it has a soul and has a spirit. You know, the Word of God talks about the end times, uh, things going on and stuff. And, wow, well, that's pretty demonic. They'd be able to do that. It's creating a super, and we could go off some really deep stuff here, but not, not, that's not what this is about. But yes, to answer your question, it is an abomination. And my thought goes to, how much longer is God going to put up with this? How, and the question should be, which we don't know, is how full is his cup? Is this full? Or is it this full? Did I just run that? Yes, uh-oh. Uh-oh. Can't find it. We'll get some batteries. So the question is, how full is his cup? I don't know. But every generation has thought, oh, his cup must be full because of this. Maybe, maybe not. If you will just allow Christ to be the head and follow and obey his leading, you're going to be fine. You need to have the heart of David. Wake up in the morning, Lord, show me. In the evening, Lord, show me. If there be anything that's not right in there, Lord, show me. And when he shows you, don't say, well, you know, we're not that one, Lord. <laughs> I want to hang on to that one. No, when he shows you, be willing to deal with it. Amen? Amen. Second Timothy 4, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Each one of you have a ministry. The enemy wants to take that away from you. You have a witness. You have a testimony. Many of you may be in the midst of a test right now, but that test is going to produce a testimony. Amen? Look at your neighbor and say, endure the test. You got a testimony coming, praise God. Hallelujah. I truly believe that all afflictions come for the word's sake. When it's coming at a believer, it's coming to steal the word of God. So that you can't stand, you won't stand, but you'll start backing up. It's, ooh, that didn't work out too well, man. Oh my goodness. Stand. When you're done, all to stand. What? Just continue to stand, praise God. The enemy is not resting and continues to devise his schemes. He's got a lot of schemes. He's had a lot of time to think up schemes and plans. Those are the fiery darts. Those are the arrows that are being shot at you. The, the Roman soldiers would take their shields and dip them into the water so that when a 
fiery dart would come, it would not burn their shield up and leave them exposed. They had a move, I think I talked about this also, but they had a move that was called the Tornos move. And they would all move together, and they were all right-handed, by the way, that were there. I guess if you were left-handed, you better learn how to fight right-handed and maybe being very dexterous. But, but they would move in ranks together with the shields locked into place, and when it was time when they would get close enough to the enemy, because the enemy's lobbing stuff, and they're just marching forward. They march with the kid. They're marching forward. And they get right up there to the enemy, and they... Yes, Paul. Yes. He does. Yes. Is something else, and then it becomes the same one again. Yeah. And I have seen in my life that he's tried to attack me through my family and friends over and over the same tactic. You know why? Why is that? Because that's where you're most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Family and friends. Those you trust. Man, I've, I've noticed the guy in the mirror sometimes, the one that gets to me. Y'all didn't get that. Come on. Seriously, he goes to tour, he goes for the weakest link. He goes for those that may be a little more attuned to listening to him. Seriously, think about the story over in First Kings. I may finish up on this. We'll see. But the prophet God had instructed him. I think you're on First Kings chapter thirteen. If you want to turn there, you can. But the prophet, God had instructed him with King Jeroboam to go and take care of business with Bethel. And he went in and protect, pronounced judgment there. He was doing everything that God told him to do. And the Lord even told him, he says, Now don't you dare go out the way that you came in. And don't you dare eat or drink any food. Because if you do... It's not going to be good. But God gave him instruction to do a specific thing and to do it a specific way. And I will tell you this morning, we've been given specific instructions here, have we not? Certain ways to do things and what have you. And we're supposed to worship in spirit and in truth, amen? But as he went and he did what God told him to do, he was being obedient. And he was headed out of town and not going the way he came in. And another prophet, an older prophet, heard about him, that he did it. Now, I don't quite get and understand all that was around that one guy, that one prophet, that older prophet. But he told his sons, he says, go and lay on the ass so I can go down and meet up with this prophet. And as he went out, he found him and he was sitting under an oak tree. He stopped. Probably taking a rest. Probably been best for him to keep on going, right? Go in the spirit of Elijah, I would say. <laughs> Outrun the chariots. But he stopped, and this older prophet found him. And he said, hey, come to my house. I got food. I got some vittles. <laughs> I got some good food that I'd like to feed you. And he said, oh, no, 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 I can't. God told me not to do that. If you read there in the text, that old prophet told him, he said, well, an angel of the Lord came and spoke the word to me. And said for you to do it. He said, oh, okay. And he went with him. He was disobeying God. He took the word of another prophet. Because the prophet told him, I'm just as you are. I'm a prophet just like you. And he yielded to him. But God had already given him instruction, had he not? If you know the story, if you don't, read it. When you go home today. But the ultimate thing was that God gave him instruction. But instead of yielding and staying yielded to God, he yielded to a man. And I'd say that he yielded to a lying spirit in that man. Because it says that when he says, the angel of the Lord came to me, the word of the Lord has spoken to me, that you need to come with me, you need to come down and sit and have some vittles, you need to have some food with me, and you need to drink and refresh yourself and all this and that. 
God had told him, no, don't you do that. You get out of the land. You go this, go the opposite way you came in. And he yielded. And he went. He disobeyed God. And as a result, yeah, he gets belly filled. Met a fleshly need. But what he did was he abdicated his, the thing that God told him to do. And after he left, well, while the, the text says actually that the word of the Lord, the real word of the Lord came upon the older prophet while he was there, they pronounced judgment on him because he disobeyed God. And after he left, what happens? You got it right there? What happens in the text? Something met him in the way, did it? He got, well, no, he didn't get eaten. says that it didn't, it tore him. It talks about a lion. And when the prophet had his sons lay his ass and go out there because he heard about it, it says that the lion was just standing there next to the carcass. He didn't eat it, but he killed him. That's the goal there of the enemy. But that lion was doing what God had it do. Would you stand with me, please? The picture you need to get this morning is God has given you His Word. He's given you His instruction. And when you yield to what a demon or even a man says, or I would say it's a demon through a man or a woman or whatever, you are abdicating what God has called you to, and you need to stand firm in the Word of God. Because the ultimate design is to kill, steal, and destroy. God's clear in His Word. We're not to have sin in the camp, are we? No. But we do from time to time, because why? We're not... What's that word? It starts with a P? Perfect. Perfect. No. Perfect. Did I hear it? Perfect. How many of you perfect? Well, if you say you are, you're full of pride. <laughs> Need to deal with that. The heart of David wasn't that he was perfect, but when sin was in the camp of his heart and the prophet came and said, hey, <laughs> somebody did this and did that. He was like, oh, judgment. That's you. He repented. He repented. Said, Lord, forgive me, I've done wrong. And did David do a lot of wrong things? You bet you he did. But the heart of David is to love God and then when you do mess up, you just say, Lord, I realize I messed up. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me and help me. We see, we see a picture. I can't remember where it's at in, in, in the text, in the scripture. But there was some things going on in Israel. And what had happened was there was sin in the camp. You, you might remember where it's at. Was it in Exodus? And there was a certain man that had brought in a woman that was outside of Israel, which is a picture of sin. And they were literally in the tent together. And when they started casting lots, if I remember right, it started falling. And finally they realized, uh, it's so-and-so. And I forget the guy's name. But I think about this with sin within myself. Lord, help me have to have that spirit. Then when I see something going on at my camp, to grab a spear, grab a javelin, and run, and deal with it immediately, and don't wait, don't drag my feet. We need to deal with sin. Be careful for nothing. Is that a sin? Anxiety? Yeah, it is. I would propose that when you start getting a hold of your significance, your acceptance, your security in the Lord and who he says you are in him, it just naturally starts dealing with those issues in there. But have a willingness and a readiness of heart that when the Lord has spoken to your heart to deal with whatever's there. Worship team, would you come up, please? I know this about my Lord. He's faithful. I know this about my Lord. 
that when the word, the word is preached without compromise, there's something already stirring in the spirit of the Lord within the hearts of men and women. So I know this, that my God is faithful, that I, have, as I have preached forth the word of God, that the Lord has probably shown some of you there might be some areas within your heart that you need to let go. And you need to ask the Lord to forgive you for not doing what he's told you to do. And stop listening to the devil in that thing. And allow the devil to bring more fear in. Fear is this. This is going to happen or that's going to happen. If you don't do this, this is going to happen. What it does is it brings in doubt of who our Father God is in heaven and who he wants to be for you and who he is for you. It removes trust. And I'm going to tell you the first lie in the garden, remove the trust. But even in the garden, God knew. And it was prophesied that there's one coming who has already came, but he's got another time to come. That's still to come. But I would have you know that this morning he came in order to set you free from all your fears, your stresses, your anxieties, your insecurities, not feeling safe, feeling insignificant. Because it says, I love you. And if you'll just trust me, the word is not the end of thy mouth, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, what's going to happen? You'll be saved. And saved means be delivered. Hallelujah. So deliverance is, is being set free, glory to God. Quit letting the enemy bring in these fears, stresses, and anxieties and be set free this morning in Jesus' name. Would you do that? Amen. Whatever God's dealing with you in your heart, just, just come up here. Brother, would you move this back just a little bit? Praise God. No one come help him. Or, yeah, all three of you can. Praise God. Let go and let God. I love that saying. Let go and let God. Hallelujah. I had a, a sister-in-law years ago. She had a dream. And she said, the Lord gave me this dream. And in this dream, I was in a well. I was holding on to a rock. Uh, a, a rope, and I, I think other people have had dreams similar to this. She says, I'm holding on for dear life, and she says, and I look down and I can't see what's below me. And she says, but I'm in a well, it must be deep, and if I let go, I will perish. She says, but I felt like God was telling me just to let go and trust him, and he's going to work it out. And she says, I finally mustered it up within myself to just trust the Lord and let go and say, God, here it is, here am I. And she says, as I let go in my dream, she says, I went down about six inches. <laughs> this was dark in the well, but the Lord let her see and understand. Let go this morning. Would you let go this morning? As the worship team plays, I'd encourage you to come forward and let go and let God. Amen.